Hello and welcome to BharatShakti.in. I am Brigadier Chatterjee. Today we are going to be talking about Ukraine and in that we will limit ourselves to only the firepower aspect of the war. Now this is in fact part of a series that we will be running on Ukraine. The first one being on firepower being utilized in the war by the Russians as well as by the Ukrainians. Well, uh, there are plenty of elements which go into a battlefield. And by far, is one of the most important elements. To explain in detail about it, I have with me a very uh, eminent guest, uh, General P. R. Shankar. General Shankar has been the Director General Artillery in service, and after service, he's with the IIT Chennai as a Professor of Processes. Uh, welcome, General Shankar. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, very good morning to you, and a Happy New Year to the Bharat Shakti team and all our viewers. Um, I'm glad you called me over for this uh, issue of firepower in Ukraine. Uh, uh, thank you, General Shankar, and Happy New Year to you also. Uh, let me start by just explaining what I thought is relevant uh, before we take off for this discussion. And actually, the first question leads from there. Uh, you see, a firepower on maneuver, I would say, are the two elements in the battle battlefield which have been there consistently, constantly, right from ages when warfare was first really, uh, I would say, uh, gone really practiced. But uh, uh, in spite of the fact that there are other elements which have now come into the battlefield, like electronic warfare, you have artificial intelligence, you have big data also playing a role. But the preeminence of these two elements, firepower and maneuver, remain. Now, when you look into uh, the way the battle is being fought in Ukraine, you have a feeling that uh, between these two, firepower is the one which is playing the more predominant role. So I would like to uh, get your ideas on how you look at this battle. I think you're right, sir, when you say firepower is, you know, fire and move is the fundamental of, uh, you know, warfare. And, uh, you know, in this war, uh, firepower has had a, you know, huge influence. And moreover, if you see across the board, across all battlefields, you'll agree with me, the space for maneuver has reduced. You know, uh, fixed borders, uh, very little scope for maneuver. But in this case, logically, there was a lot of scope for maneuver. But the entire operation in the first phase, when the battle took key, when the southern thrust started, when it was winter, it was rapustita conditions. There were no maneuver possible. So it was only firepower. And then with with long range firepower, they could the Russians could reach almost every part of Ukraine. So actually they maneuvered through firepower. And firepower en enabled maneuver. But later, when you know there was really they were in the phase two of the offensive in Donbass and Luzangs, the that they didn't have much space to maneuver. So firepower uh, you know dominated. So overall, if you see it was uh, firepower, which was, uh, you know, the, the, the predominant factor in this, uh, uh, you know, entire Ukraine war. In fact, uh, many articles are there in New York uh, Times and Science Today and Washington Post and Wall Street Journal about the primacy of artillery and how it has been used. And mind you, it is from both sides. Right. Uh, I mean, I like I like your view on it, actually. No, I quite agree with you, and that's why I said that perhaps my views lead to my question, and that is, uh, and it's a fact that uh, the maneuver forces could not make much of a difference. If the maneuver forces could have made a difference, the Russians had far more of it than the whatever Zelensky could have possibly put together. But what you see is an army, of course, trying to get to Kiev the capital city, but getting stuck, well, because of terrain, because of uh, some problems in their planning of operations. But then ultimately, the destruction and withdrawal of that armored formation, I think, was primarily by the use of firepower. Where is firepower means by the Ukrainians? You're quite right, uh, General, what you said. And if I may go on to the next issue, uh, give us a small idea, a brief idea about, uh, well, firepower means available initially. Uh, who was the one who had more, who was the one who had, had less, and what kind of induction of firepower means followed thereafter as the battle progressed. 
initially so the ukrainians had the old soviet uh, firepower based firepower basically 152 guns and short range missile systems and uh, russia also had similar firepower but they also had modern firepower they had long range missiles they had hypersonic missiles which they fired they had cruise missiles plethora of them right the preponderance was with the russians initially and they used it till the nato countries started pumping in firepower uh, to ukraine now the pumping in of firepower to ukraine firepower resources to ukraine happened in two stages one stage the first stage was the european nations gave some firepower you know 155 mm firepower to ukraine but later the us came in a big way and the two major i t- tickets which they were given were the m777 and the uh, uh, you know that uh, high mars that is a high mobility rocket system and they were also given some uh, weapon locating radars which were quite effective the antpq 37s so these three things came in in quite a lot and uh, this thing uh, given to ukraine with which ukraine could you know start matching russia and uh, you know uh, got some successes uh, I mean, like, yeah. Please go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Your 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 call. Uh, like uh, I think you're quite right when you say that initially uh, the firepower resources of these two parties, the Russians and the Ukrainians, didn't match at all. The Russians had overwhelming superiority, perhaps. In fact, Russians have used. Uh, uh, they are known to be using firepower in a very in very big concentrations. Right to see the was that they fought from Second World War <clears throat> onwards. But uh, uh, what made a difference is, like you said, that uh, the firepower means were made available by the NATO countries, by the United States, to these people, the Ukrainians. And ultimately, the Ukrainians possibly uh, had adequate to defend themselves and later on perhaps to push back. That we'll go into a little later. Um, In fact, suppose, one more thing uh, which the, uh, yeah. you know, you- Ukraine's got Ukrainians got in a large measure were drones. You know, the drones combined with the firepower means uh, actually tilted the tables. It's not that Russia didn't have drones. Russia did have drones. In fact, the major lesson out of this uh, Ukrainian war is the the requirement of uh, you know the sensor seeker integration, right? And unless you have the sensor seeker integration and you can observe fire. It's not going to be useful at all. So I think that's a that one resource which Ukrainian got in plenty from uh, you know the Western. I nations. think it applies uh, across the board, uh, all countries. Now the sensor seeker relationship that you're talking about, sensor seeker uh, coordination, because with ranges going so far longer now with fire of the firepower means, you really do not know the effect at the other end until unless you have a proper sensor placed there to observe and then give you the feedback. And not only to observe, sir, it's also to acquire the target. Definitely. Right. You acquire the target, observe it and see the damage. All the all, whole loop you have to con- this thing. And one more thing which is a very important lesson which has come out in this, I think, is that the sensors, uh, the sensors and shooters have to be integrated at unit level. So that means all the sensors, all the drones have to be integral to our artillery unit. And that's a big lesson for us. Unless you have artillery units, their OP officers having drones, uh, you're not going. Uh, and at brigade level, you need to have longer range drones for us to be successful. Otherwise, we are not going to. We are out of the back. Yes, I think the old concept of just having a forward observation officer or an air observation post also is inadequate. You really have to go much further inside with your sensor as. Clear. It's, uh, I mean, it's compatible with the range that you achieve with your gun that your sensor should be able to play, be able to detect what's really happening at that objective and, area which you're following. Yeah, if I add one more issue is that with longer ranges, say like your ATCAMS, that is your HIMARS, which is with the 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers range, and which we are also planning of in our rocket force and all that, you need to integrate, uh, you know, the uh, space element also. And probably you'll have to insert some special forces to control fires in the rear. And 
if you got to have so many sensors, OP officers, SF of people in the rear space, drones, even AOP, and uh, you know even fighter aircraft if required to you know give you some fix, then you need to have networking, which is something which is which is not evident in this particular battle. But I think you, if you were looking at countering a adversary like China. Across the Himalayas, I think you need networking. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit about uh, when we talk about firepower means in terms of missiles? Yeah, you need long-range missiles. Sir. I mean, one thing which Russia has shown. See, Russia used missiles not only for destruction; they used it as a deterrent force. They, the Russian missiles, used long-range missiles for destruction, degradation. Systematically, they dismantled Ukrainian, uh, you know, uh, weapon systems and weapon factories and all that. And they also prevented, you know, with their hypersonic uh, missiles, they prevented um, NATO from entering into the conflict, right? Because the reach went up to the NATO borders, Poland border, and all that. So they, pre and then one interesting fact is that. Uh, the Russians combined the nuclear threat with conventional deterrence. The moment they put that conventional deterrence and nuclear threat interchangeably through the missiles, because that's ambiguity. You, when you fire a missile, you don't know whether it's a nuclear warhead or a normal warhead. Right. So with that ambiguity, they melded it and you, you, you found a different kind of application of firepower. And this is going to be a live factor for us because that prevented NATO from joining in. And this is going to be a live problem for us when we deal with the adversary like Pakistan or PLA, one of the two. Any one of the two, in fact, for that matter. Okay. Uh, I'll get into the next issue that we can discuss a little bit. Uh, you see, initially, like I said in the beginning itself, uh, the Russians advanced and they advanced uh, pretty much fast. Or oh, they advanced to Kiev, they advanced uh, eastwards, uh, sorry, westwards uh, along their borders. Etc. It was a pretty broad-based uh, advance, couple of thrusts going into Ukraine. But these got stalled, partly because of, well, wrong operational plans and partly because of the terrain and partly because, well, they perhaps didn't expect that kind of uh, resistance. And like you said, uh, that uh, the resistance built up with the accretion of firepower resources. So I'd like you to discuss this a little more. Uh, to what extent you feel firepower has really turned the table to a point in Ukrainian operations, uh, in the operations launched by Ukrainians, as far as the Russians are concerned, putting them on the back foot now? Uh, that's a very interesting point you brought up, sir, actually. You see, the Russians used it to cover the entire Ukraine, right? They had a, lot of, they had a preponderance of firepower, if you remember, when they went into Kyiv. At that time, the Ukrainians didn't have that much firepower. They had only basically, you know, 152 mm guns with about 20 kilometers of range, Akatsyas. And then they had smudge with about 60, 70 kilometers of range, or maybe 80 kilometers from, depending on which variant they were using, which that is not clear. Just these two equipment, the Ukrainians didn't, they fought a defensive battle and they didn't, uh, you know, use it for degradation and all that. The Ukrainians used their limited artillery as part of an ambush force. They allowed, you know, they targeted stretches of roads where the Russians had to cross. And they used to put some barricade or something. A typical, you know, if you see ambushes in the old west, wild west where, you know, railway tracks were blockaded and then you see cowboys coming and hitting you. Sim something similar. So these people made the convoys halt. The moment those convoys halted and you know Russian forces halted, the uh, Ukrainians used to pick it up with the help of a drone. And in that ambush area, they, from a remote, about 30, 40 kilometers away, they used to fire a smudge battery and finish them off. And halt. They had complete, uh, you know, the advance of into Kyiv. It was, I thought it was the uh, the 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 firepower ambush system is something really worth lear uh, learning. Then they use track and kill operations. Now, when you say track and kill, say a Russian artillery fires uh, or and then they scoot. Once they scoot and go back to the hide, 
the Ukrainians started tracking them with drones. And then when they they caught the hide and they destroyed the hide. Now we all know, you know, that the hide has got ammunition, it has got more yeah, launchers. Yeah. So they got more uh, uh, you know results. I, it was very innovative. And later on, once the Americans gave them the M triple sevens, now the M triple sevens were taken up to roving positions quite close up because it's a light weapon system. Even a Jonga can tow it, or a Jonga class of a vehicle, or even a car can tow it. If the weather is, I mean, if the roads are good, which are okay in Ukraine, they're not hills and all that. So they used to go and wait. Okay. If the Russian power was deploying or the, their, uh, you know, missiles or rocket units were about to deploy, these chaps used to fire in spoiling attack mode. Okay. Uh, that's very innovative use of firepower I yeah. guess, as far as the Ukrainians are concerned. Uh, I have a feeling they must have had uh, NATO advisors or American advisors to be uh, so matured in their employment of uh, artillery. Anyway, uh, General they, I, 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 a last point. You know, it's not only that having an American advisors. You must realize that the Ukrainians and the Russians had the same training, so they know each other how they operate. And Ukrainians used but, them that training, that knowledge, imaginatively, where the Russians didn't. No, that was a big help. I think we probably yeah, brought I, out the right I, I Big help. They're already familiar with them. They have been operating with them. So obviously, it's so easier to integrate there on a the battlefield also. Uh, right, General. I think we will end up over here. This is uh, what I would say. This is the part one that we have done. Uh, we'll take on part two, certain other issues that I have for you, like ammunition and, uh, well, mobility, etc. that we'll go into in the next part. So thank you so much, General, for having joined us. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, sir. Good evening. Right. Uh, thank you, viewers. Thanks for following us on the channel. And uh, we will be back with uh, part two of uh, use of firepower in Ukraine in a couple of days' time. Do look out for us. And please, in between, like us, go to our site, like us, share whatever you see and whatever you like. And do let us know in case you, there are subjects that you would like to be covered by us. Thank you.